In this position, the third world champion blundered. Capablanco was playing as black, and when white pushed the pawn forward, he captured it. As you can see, this is a blunder. He totally missed the winning idea. And what's interesting is this comes from the book Logical Chess Move by Move, and the author actually thought he played a good move as well. Nobody really understood what exactly was going on. I'm going to explain it to you. We're going to talk about what Stockfish notices. And obviously, they didn't have Stockfish back when this game was played. This was played almost 100 years ago. But it's still very instructive to see what exactly he missed, what Stockfish says. And ultimately, you're going to see how to win a game when you have some pass pawns on the side of the board like Capablanca has here. All right, so here we go. Capablanca is playing as black. This is episode 31 in the series logical chess move by move he brings out the knight which controls the e4 square so white plays c4 very very common stuff and now he plays e6 and then goes into what's called the nimzo indian defense so one of the things about the nimzo indian is that you try to control these light squares very very early on and the way that you do that is by using your bishop to either pin or trade off white's knight that goes to c3 because the knight on c3 is usually the piece that's kind of countering your knight on f6 and so by trading that off with your bishop you gain control of the light squares now of course if white wants to do the same thing they can bring their bishop out and trade it for here and it kind of balances out but that's kind of the major idea behind the nimzo indian so white plays queen c2 which at first glance might seem like a weird move like don't you want to develop your pieces and do some other stuff but queen c2 is a move that a lot of people play if they're worried about doubled pawns okay so if you look at any other random move that white might play Black could always trade here whenever they want, and now you have these doubled pawns that you have to worry about, right? So when you play queen to c2, you're basically saying, look, if you're going to take me, now I have the option to take with my queen, and I keep my pawns nice and pretty. There's no doubled pawns. There's no pawn weaknesses. And if you're a very positional player, this might be a move that, that you would consider playing, queen to c2, okay? So just keep that in mind. Queen to c2. Capablanca plays d5, getting a pawn in the center. Knight to f3 is played, which looks like a supernatural move. I've given it a question mark because it actually doesn't prevent white from, I'm sorry, black from playing c5. And one of the things he mentions in the book is that if black can play d5 and c5 in a queen's pawn opening without any problems, without any negative effects, basically, then black is essentially equalized. And that is exactly what Capablanca does. He plays c5, he's, he's got a great position, and he doesn't really have anything to worry about. If you're wondering what white should have done instead of knight f3, what a lot of the top players do in this position is actually trade the pawn, play bishop g5, and it's a bit more challenging for you to play c5. Like, you can still do it, but once you play c5 now, they're going to take here, and white's created this isolated pawn they're already kind of in position to, to attack that because the bishop is here maybe the rook is going to come over it's not quite so simple for black now this is playable some people still do this but it's a bit more an ag of an aggressive approach for white which is a good strategy knight to f3 going back to the game doesn't really put the same pressure on black's position that a move like bishop to g5 would and, and by trading the pawns early so that's kind of the difference all right, so white trades here, and Capablanca recaptures with the queen. Now, you'll notice the knight is pinned to the king, so he's not losing his queen, and he's getting control over these light squares by using the queen. This is a different way to do it. You could also capture with the pawn, but he puts the queen there. White plays the move a3, and here's a good moment to test yourself. What move would you play in this position? Well, if you had a chance to look at that, I hope you didn't say bishop to a5, because bishop to a5 is a huge blunder. And the reason is because now white's going to play b4, which attacks your bishop. And you might be thinking, Nelson, that's not a big deal. I'm just going to take it. But here's the problem. Your queen is now under attack because as soon as white played b4, guess what? The pin that was there before is no longer there, which means your queen's under attack. You're going to simply lose your queen, right? And yes, there's b3 check, which kind of looks like a nice move. Like, oh, I'm going to get my queen back. But after queen to c3, you could take it. But then when white recaptures, look what has happened. One, two, three, four. You only have three pieces. You actually ended up losing a piece in that exchange. Okay, so it's not a good trade, not what you wanted to do. And it had to do with the fact that b4 is a very clever move that breaks the pin. Okay, so you have to be really careful. When your bishop is pinning a knight that is attacking your queen, usually if they're going to like chase you away, you have to just trade. You don't really have an option to go back in those situations. Okay, and so that's what Capablanca does. He simply trades, gets rid of that knight, and permanently gains some control over those white squares. All right, so Capablanca develops the knight, attacks the center, and white played the move e3 just to kind of defend. Now, I have a question for you. If instead of e3, if they would have played the move c4, attacking your queen, what move would you have played here? 
Well, if you had a chance to look at that, the best move is actually not retreating your queen. Now, you could do that. You could retreat your queen, and it's not a terrible position for black, but it's not the best response. The best response is knight takes d4, which counterattacks white's queen. So if they take you, guess what? You take their queen, and on top of that, you get the fork, and you're going to win the rook in the corner. And if they decide to trade your knight first, guess what? You don't recapture with the pawn and lose your queen. You take with the queen. And now your queen stays in this very aggressive square, attacks the rook. And if they play bishop to b2, you can simply drop back to d6. But that was the best move because you're simply winning this pawn on d4, basically. You're just getting a pawn for free. But you had to see this tactical idea of being able to save your queen when you recaptured. Okay, so try to stay alert. Those moments can pop up. When you're least expecting them, I think a lot of people here would simply move their queen back. All right, so back to the game. White plays e3. Capablanca castles. Bishop to e2. Capablanca trades. And now white has a decision of which way do you want to capture here. Now, in the game, they decided to take with the c-pawn. Um, there's generally, the, the principle is capture towards the center. So when you have a situation like this, which pawn is going towards the center of the board? Well, the C pawn. And so that's what white does, they capture towards the center. You take one of your side pawns and you bring it a little bit closer to the center, that's usually a good decision. However, in this particular case, you could make an argument that taking this way is better because it lets the bishop out. Now you have options of where this bishop can go, right? Uh, it's a trade-off, it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve. Another thing to think about is that generally speaking, you want to have less pawn islands. An island is a group of pawns that are connected along files. So this is an island here that I have highlighted. This is an island, and then black has islands here. So if white would have taken this way, you now have one, two, three pawn islands, as opposed to going back to the game, only two islands. Like I said, generally speaking, very generally speaking, Less islands is better, but of course that, that depends. So that's what white decided to do. All right, so Capablanca plays b6. He's going to activate his bishop, which is kind of stuck here. And if you look at this position, what do you think Capablanca's major advantage is in the position? Well, if you had a chance to think about that, the major advantage is these two pawns against this one pawn. This is what's called a queenside pawn majority. You have more pawns than your opponent on the queen side. Now, you might be thinking, but Nelson, white has a majority right here. Doesn't that just kind of balance out? What's the big deal? Uh, I believe, this is just my understanding, if you think about it, white's probably going to castle this way, right? That's where the king's going to be safer, like black did. Once that happens, if pieces start getting traded off, okay, and you go into an end game where there's just a couple of pieces and some pawns, and these guys start pushing down, and let's just say these guys start pushing down at the same time. Maybe white creates a pass pawn right here, black creates a pass pawn maybe, let's just say, over here or somewhere. It's going to be very easy for Black's King to go one, two, three, and guess what? I'm right in front of your pass pawn. Easy for me to stop. It's much more difficult for White's King to go one, two, three, four, five, or six to stop one of these pass pawns. You see how much further away it is. That's those two moves might not seem like a lot, but that could be all it takes to win the game at the end. And so that's why I think a lot of times the queenside pawn majorities can be a little bit more valuable as you get closer to the end game. Right at this stage in the game, there's too many pieces. It doesn't really mean anything, but those are probably going to get traded, and that's the advantage. All right, so white plays knight d2, and this is a good moment to, to uh, pause and test yourself. What would you play in this position as black? All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, the move that Capablanca played was simply developing the bishop, which is kind of the whole point of why he played b6. If you said queen takes g2, that is a big, big mistake. Now, there's two things that I don't like about this move. Number one, you always have to be careful opening up files on your king. However, in this particular position, white doesn't have a way to take advantage of that. They can't go rook g1, you just would take it, right? But what they can do is bishop to f3, which attacks the queen, defends the rook, and attacks the knight at the same time, you're gonna have to lose a piece, and that's just basically a winning position for white, okay? So I had to avoid that little pitfall, and of course, uh, Capablanca was not going to fall for that. That's not really why white played this move. They wanted to put their bishop on that diagonal, so they're just clearing the way, but I wanted to point that out. Hopefully you didn't say queen takes g2. So bishop to b7 is played. So we get bishop to f3, queen goes back to d7, White castles, and Capablanca plays the rook over to c8. Now, question for you guys, why did Capablanca play rook to c8? What is the threat that comes along with this move? You got a chance to look at that? Hopefully you noticed knight takes d4 is the immediate threat. For example, if, I don't know, white just plays a random move, knight takes d4, unleashes the rook, which attacks the queen, so you can't take back or you simply lose your queen, all right? 
And so white had to deal with that. And the way that they decided to do that was queen to b1, just getting away from the discovered attack with the brook. All right, now I have a question for you guys. If you look at this bishop on f3 and this bishop on b7, which bishop do you think is better? Well, I would say probably white's bishop. I mean, this looks like a really a nice square for the bishop. It's controlling a lot of important squares. It's shutting down this knight from really moving. It's kind of lined up here. It looks like a really, really great bishop. Black's bishop, eh, not so much. I mean, it's kind of blocked right now. Yes, it's on the same diagonal, but it's not really doing as, as much at the moment. So what do you think Capablanca does? Well, knight to a5. He said, let's, let's go ahead and trade my not so great bishop for my opponent's really powerful bishop. And this is something that a lot of strong players do very regularly. They find their worst pieces and they trade them for pieces that are better, right? And if you can accomplish that over and over and over again as the game goes on, your position gradually gets better and better and better, okay? And that's exactly what Capablanca is doing here. Not to mention, the knight might also have ideas of jumping into these squares in the future, which, which we'll see, all right? All right, so white trades. And the author mentions that these pawns are very valuable because if we push them forward, we can probably create a pass pawn on the queen side, which I kind of already talked about, but that's a, a key feature that's that Capablanca is looking at. All right, so we get bishop to b2, queen to a6. He's putting this queen on a nice diagonal here, kind of potentially threatening to invade and just start really attacking all kinds of stuff. White stops that. The knight jumps over, rook to c6. He's getting ready to double up his rooks on the open file, which is always a great plan. Jumps in gets rid of the bishop, and you might say, isn't he, you know, allowing this bishop, which is not that great, to be traded for a knight, which is pretty powerful? And here's the thing. He wants to focus on this section of the board where he has the two pawns against one. The bishop is kind of in the way. It's sort of controlling some of those squares, stopping things from happening, even though, yes, the bishop's not amazing. Bishops can very quickly change, right? Like, it could be very, like, for example, let's say you move. At some point in the future, d5 could happen, and all of a sudden, this bishop now is a monster, right? And so, because of that, he says, you know what, let's go ahead, trade that guy off. It's kind of clearing out the position, getting me closer to the end game, where my two against one pawns are going to be more and more powerful. Okay, so that's what's going on. So we get the trade. Knight comes over, he doubles up the rooks, getting total control over the c file, and now white can't play moves like rook c2 or rook c1, because they simply lose a rook when black recaptures. Now, what's interesting here is the author mentions something. He says that Marshall uh, made an observation. The hardest thing to do is to win a one game. And it's funny because Capablanca is, is a world champion. He's got a great position. He's totally winning. But you know what's coming, right? He's going to blunder in the future. And I just think that's really interesting. Like, even the best players in the world struggle with winning one games, right? Now, of course, it makes it easier when I have Stockfish telling me, like, oh, you made a mistake. They didn't have that 100 years ago. But still... Um, it's very, very difficult to continue to be accurate for an entire game. Okay, let's take a look at how this, this blunder happened. So he brings the knight in. He's putting pressure on the isolated A pawn. White pushes it to try to hold on. He blocks off the rook. This is called a an interference tactic, right? Where you're interfering with a piece's ability to defend. He also hits the queen at the same time. Queen goes up and he captures the pawn. So now he's got two pawns that are passed on the queen side. He's ready to start pushing them down the board. But it's not over yet. So let's keep going. Rook to e2 is played. Now, this is one moment where Stockfish says that was a huge mistake. The correct line was bringing the rook over here to pin this guy and put the pressure on it. And I'm just going to show you this line, which is very, very long and complicated. Queen b5, trying to basically say, look, if you take my knight, I'll take your queen. And if you take my queen, I will take your queen, and I've defended, and now I have my two pawns, and I'm happy. But what Stockfish says white could have done would be queen here. If the knight tries to jump in, you bring the queen over to g5, offer the trade. You allow this check. Then you go here. Notice the knight is being attacked twice. So you have to move the knight. Or you're going to lose it. You can counterattack here. Now you have to move it. Look at this, this is kind of wild because you're attacking here, but it's not defended, but you're also attacking here. You're gonna have the in-between move. This is very complicated, but basically you get this end game. And now white's just doing fine. They have the rook behind the pass pawn, which is exactly where you want your rook to be. And they have their own pass pawn on the D file. Stockfish says this is a draw, basically. This is totally equal, maybe slightly better for black because the pawns are a little bit better, but realistically, it's probably gonna end in a draw. I show that just to, to show you that 
even though Capablanca has been outplaying his opponent this entire game, there's still a way to just get a draw if you're if you're able to see this, right? Again, this is an engine line. Nobody's going to see all that in a, in a normal game, but I just wanted to point it out. All right, so let's go back to the game here. Instead, he plays rook to e2, okay? b5 pushes the pawn, d5, and right here we have the moment that I mentioned at the start of the game, at the start of the video, where Capablanca blunders, okay? And it's a very obvious move of, I'll just take the pawn, why not? I'm creating an isolated pawn, which are usually targets. Uh, what could possibly be the problem with taking that pawn? Let me explain to you what Stockfish finds here. So first I'll explain why Stockfish doesn't like this position for black, then we'll go back and I'll give you a chance to pause and see if you can find the stockfish move that actually wins the game for black rather than taking this pawn. So the problem is this. Uh, basically, after you push here, stockfish says you play the move rook to a1, which is not what happened in the game. Okay, this is not how the game went. But if you play rook to a1, you're controlling back here. This is important. For example, try to push your pawn right away. Look at this check. It's a fork. You're going to lose your pawn. Okay, so what stockfish says, look, we're going to stop that right away. Oops, sorry, that was not what happened. Uh, I mean, that was what happened. This is what Stockfish said. Sorry. Uh, Stockfish says, look, we're going to stop that right away. Okay. And let's just say Black continues pushing their pawns. This is what Stockfish wanted to happen. The rook invades. You get the rook behind the pawn and you push it like this. And this is actually a dangerous threat that the rook is here. The rook is behind the pass pawn. This is not simple for Black to defend. Stockfish says this is kind of an equal position. Even though you have the two pawns over here, you can't immediately push these. You have to pay attention to your king. You have to pay attention to this pass pawn. And, and this is just a good position for white. It's, it's equal, basically, right? That is why Stockfish says no. Trading this pawn on d5 was not the correct approach. Okay, and of course, it's easy for me with Stockfish to say, oh, yeah, of course, Capablanca should have played this, right? The author of the book says he takes d5 was a great move. Capablanca obviously thought it was a great move. He ended up winning the game without any problems. His opponent didn't see what, what he could have done. So practically it was fine. But this is what Stockfish said he needed to play to actually just win the game right away. Actually, if you want to pause, what do you think the best move is for Black? You got a chance to look at that. The move is Rook takes F3. And this is kind of wild. Honestly, I didn't expect anybody to see this or to find it. I certainly didn't when I was looking at this. Um, I was like, why are we giving up our Rook for the night? Like, I don't really see anything as a follow-up. But watch the idea. We're going to invade with our queen. King's going to move. We're going to invade with our rook. Now we're creating some checkmate threats. For example, this is checkmate. Okay. King has to run. And now we go. So this is kind of the, the point. We wanted to open up white's king side and then attack them with our other pieces. If you try to just immediately kind of jump down here and do this... It's not the same thing. The king just has a very easy way to escape. We really have no threat. This is not a big threat. We just lose a piece and we're losing the game, right? There's no point to doing that. So you sack the rook first because now when we invade, we're actually threatening checkmate. Now it's a serious attack, okay? So that's kind of the initial point. So the king runs, check. The knight now comes over to help us attack the king. Queen moves. G5. Again, I'm not expecting that you saw this. I'm just showing you so you see. Queen to h2 is the only move because now you're threatening here, but you also needed to be on this diagonal. So queen h1 does not have the same effect. Let's say they throw in a check. They could try to take something. It doesn't really matter. There's going to be a checkmate like this. Okay, that's one. Uh, there's other lines. Like, for example, if the king tries to escape here, h6... And then the queen can come to e5. Now you see the importance of going to h2 instead of h1 because you needed to come here. Uh, king e7 followed by queen d6. There's a checkmate here with, uh, what is it? Queen f8 followed by knight e5. This is a, this is like a, wow, I mean, amazing checkmate. Look at this. you got the queen here, you got the rook, and then the knight delivers the checkmate. So, I mean, that was like, what, like 10, 15 moves of stockfish calculating stuff. So like, it's not surprising that Capablanca didn't see that, right? I mean, that's just ridiculous. You can't calculate all of that. But it is just goes to show that even world champions blunder and they miss things. And this was not the winning idea, right? And it was totally missed. That being said, he wasn't playing against Stockfish. And you guys won't be playing against Stockfish either. Actually, that's not true. Sometimes you might be. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the game and see how this finished out. Um, 
So he pushes the pawn. The queen moves. Not a great move. Again, there was some crazy stockfish line where you could save the game if you play rook a1. And I don't actually remember. I think it was like... Oh, this is what we already looked at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah, this is what we looked at. This is what he was supposed to play. The rook a1, the rook e7, the d6 line, right? But he didn't see that. He played some other random move. It allowed b3. This was not the way to go. Uh, he needed to keep that pressure on the knight. Okay, so if you look carefully, b3 right now is not an option for black because you're always just going to take the knight here. As soon as he moves the queen away, now you can simply play b3. It just makes Capablanca's life easy. And I'll show you how the game finished out. He brought the rook in, traded here, works the pieces, lines up with a pin, and trades and goes into the winning endgame. He's just going to simply push the pawn, for example, uh, and attack the... Well, not right away. He's going to defend it first. Then he's going to attack, and this is a winning position for black. Okay. So, key takeaway. Um, the two pawns, going all the way back to like this moment in the game, the two pawns was the major f advantage that Capablanca had, and he used that to finish out the game. Yes, there was a blunder and some crazy stockfish lines along the way, but what you can take away from this game is when you have a queenside pawn majority, you can use that as an advantage to win the game. All right, I hope that was helpful, guys. I'll see you next time for game 32 on page 231 in the book. We are almost done with this book, by the way, and we will be uh, voting on what we want to do next. I have some really interesting ideas, so stay tuned for that, but thank you guys, and I'll see you next time. As always, stay sharp, play smart, take care.